Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. Today I've got with me Joe Schmid. I'll pull him up in just a second. And we're talking about three biggest mistakes that atheists make. Uh, should we say that this is a is sort of an online? It, it's definitely not something that every atheist makes, uh, the, the mistakes that we're talking about today. And that's important to point out at the very beginning of this is that this is not like a critique of every single atheist out there. There are definitely sophisticated atheists, especially philosophers like Graham Oppie. And so this is not a general critique of every single person, but it is uh, some of the mistakes that we found. And uh, this is this the way that this came about. I'll just uh, I'll tell you that as well at the, the very outset of this is there was actually a post, a community post by Rationality Rules, my friend Stephen Woodford, and uh, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the screen. This is what he said, and uh, this is, again, what sparked this video. In my next video, I'm going to be expressing what I consider the three biggest... Should I read this in his accent? No. Uh, <laughs> should, should I or not? No. I think, I think you, you could probably read it half in his accent. I could probably read the other half in his accent if you wanted. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like, so you guys like don't know this, but... Pod. Joe and I, uh, well, we're friends at the moment. Let me let me actually introduce Joe before we just jump right in. So Joe and I, Joe, I probably should do that. Joe and I are friends, uh, but he's got a YouTube channel it's called Majesty of Reason. He and I talk all the time. He's a philosophy nerd, kind of like I am, uh, but just on a, a different level. And I think that you can see that if you actually go like watch his content, watch his videos, stuff that he talks about. And he's also actually actively publishing in philosophy of religion. So he's a legit philosopher. Uh, but nevertheless, he's also just an awesome guy and I love him. And so definitely go subscribe to his channel, Majesty of Reason, which I've got purposely misspelled in the description of this video. But I, I do have his, his actual uh, channel linked in the description, the, the real link. So if you want to go subscribe to his channel, definitely do that. But uh, OK, so let's talk about some of our background. So we're, we're friends. We talk on Facebook all the time, uh, probably once a day, actually. Uh, but what, one of the things that we do. OK, that's that's what we need to do at the very beginning of this. I want everyone to see. And I want to see it for myself because you've only sent me audio of this. I want to see your your impression of Richard Swinburne. So give me give me like your best Richard Swinburne impression. Find something. It's so good. Y'all have y'all have got, to see I, this. Okay. I have to pull these out. I have his book over here. So. Oh, okay. So you're gonna like read something from his book? Oh wait, you can't hear me. He's got his headphone. Okay. Uh, we'll just wait. All right. The existence of God. Let me uh, put in my uh, earbuds. <laughs> we did not plan this for the audience, by the no, way. No, no, not at all. We probably should be getting on with the content, but we'll just do this anyways because it's so good. Yeah. Just wait. I wish I wish he said that is to say in here, but um Oh god, you have to add it in. <laughs> yes, I, I will, I will. Okay. Um let's see. Oh yes, the intrinsic probability. Okay. So uh <laughs> Okay. I have, uh, I have to put I you full screen for this. Start. All right. Um uh, so, hello, my name is uh, Dr. Swinburne. Um, the definition of theism, given on page 7, uh, involves the following. That exists now, that is to say, there is such a thing, the existential quantifier, uh, and always has existed and will exist, God, a spirit, that is, uh, a non-embodied person who is omnipresent, that is to say, exists everywhere at once. <laughs> That is so good. It's the it's, it's the it's pauses kind of like the little it's the little pauses that, like in the it's obviously nasally but like the yeah <laughs> I, can't, exactly. I can't do that, that is the, yeah that is to say uh, the only the only accent I've been trying to trying to work on is planning is but his voice is yeah. so low Ooh. it's so low yeah. it's so low. Uh, all right, let's not get maybe we'll do another stream where it's just like impersonating all these different people. But let's, all right, let's, uh, okay, let me pull up the the community post from Rationality Rules one more time. So we're, this is kind of like uh, stealing his idea. So uh, sorry about that, Stephen. I'm sure that your video will be a whole lot different from this, if that makes it any better. But I thought it was a good idea to kind of give our, our take on uh, what our response is. I mean, he did ask the question, what are your three? So, uh, all right, here it is. My next video, I'm going to be no. That's that sounds Australian. I'm just going <laughs> to read it. You could just read it normally. <laughs> In my next video, I'm going to be expressing what I consider the three biggest mistakes made by atheists. And despite my already having written the first draft, I thought, why not utilize the community tab to ask you, lovely lot, what you consider to be the biggest mistakes? If I find any of your suggestions better than mine, I'll borrow them, which is what we're doing here. We're borrowing this idea, all whilst, of course, graciously affording credit, but I honestly, I doubt 
you'll top mine. You won't believe number three. We won't believe it, uh, Joe. We won't believe it. All right, you take the, the last. <laughs> uh, yeah, take the so, last. Uh, yeah, so what says you? Other than neckbeards, what's the three biggest mistakes made by atheists? All right, so that's what we're talking about today, the three biggest mistakes. We're borrowing, in scare quotes, this idea. Uh, so thank you, Stephen, for the idea of the show. And let's get, so what we're going to do, though, and I didn't tell you this beforehand, but let's do the list backwards. So like your top three, and I don't know if you've got them in that order, like the top one is, number. I don't know if you have it like that in the first place, but uh, I, I guess I kind of do. So we'll start with your number three, then we'll do mine. So we, we have different uh, lists here. So that's, a, that's another Hopefully. thing to keep in mind as we're going through this. Hopefully we don't have any overlap, but we'll see. So give me your uh, your number three first. We'll talk about that a little bit, then we'll go to my number three. What is your number three? Okay, my I number three mistaken. was uh, actually has the demonstration involved. So I've got a demonstration. Uh, my mother, I, the, the title of it is the No Evidence Mantra. So you oftentimes hear mm. on internet atheist communities and whatnot, which is largely what we're focusing on—a kind of more new atheist type. Um, uh, people, you often hear them say that there is no evidence for the existence of God, or there's no evidence for theism, or there's no evidence for Christianity, and, and on and on down the list. Now, uh, I think this is a pretty big mistake, uh, and it has to do with what evidence is. So to illustrate that, I like doodled this. Now, I'm a professional artist, as you can see. So we've got two jars, okay? Jar one, and jar, let's see if I can do this backwards. Jar one, jar two, okay. So we've got jar one and jar two. Jar two has eight orange what it, jelly beans. We're going to call these jelly beans because we want to. And it's got two black jelly beans. And then jar one has eight black jelly beans and two orange jelly beans. Okay, so I'm going to perform some magic here. I'm going to put this away. Remember, jar two has predominantly orange. Jar one is predominantly black. I'm going to put that away. Bada bing, bada boom. I draw a jelly bean, and it is orange. You can see that, hopefully. Let me get the lighting. Kind anyway, it's orange, you can bright. trust me. Yeah. So uh, the question is, um, which of these do you think that that came from? Now, I think it's obvious that we should conclude that probably it came from two, right? Well, why is that? Well, because jar two has mostly orange jelly beans. Uh, and you can actually kind of formalize this, right? You can say, uh, getting an orange jelly bean is evidence for the fact that we took jelly bean from jar two because the data, namely an orange jelly bean, is more expected on the hypothesis that we drew from two than it is on the hypothesis that we drew from one. It's more expected, it's more likely. We would predict the data more on the hypothesis that we drew from uh, jar two than if we drew from jar one. So. Uh, with that out of the way, that's a kind of how philosophers and philosophers of science and scientists themselves often conceive of evidence. Evidence is something that is more expected on a hypothesis, like you you have a greater probability or expectation of seeing it, a greater likelihood of seeing it, than on the negation of that hypothesis, or perhaps on a relevant alternative hypothesis. So it's all about probability raising. Evidence is probability raising. And how do you raise that probability? You, ha you have some piece of evidence that is more expected on the hypothesis than on the competing hypothesis. So do you have any questions so far? <laughs> do, do I have questions? Uh, no, I think yeah, that's no, you. <laughs> pretty straightforward. Yeah, you're just talking about confirmation theory, yeah. how probability theory yeah. works. And, as, know, basic, as basic as I can. I don't want to get into all the equations and whatnot. But so, yeah. so that's what evidence is, okay? And with that in mind, the claim that there is no evidence for theism or for God's existence is quite quite that implausible, is very implausible. Yeah, <laughs> that is to say. It's very, very <laughs> implausible. And why is that? Well, because there do seem to be things that are much more expected on theism than on the relevant alternatives, say, let's say naturalism, right? So consider the existence of uh, free conscious moral agents, right? So plausibly, free conscious moral agents are Let me pause you there. Valuable. Okay. Yeah. Let me pause you. Yeah, this is this is a good place to pause. First of all, I want to comment on the fact that your glasses are broken. This makes you look like 10 times smarter. <laughs> You've got some tape on it. Uh, that's comment number one. Comment number two is it should be important to note to people, if you don't know who Joe is, he's an agnostic. He's not a Christian. He's not an atheist. So when he's talking about these things, he's, you know, he's saying that there is evidence for theism, for Christianity, whatever. But it's important to know that background. So he, a, a lot of 
maybe that should have made it into one of the mistakes. But one of the mistakes you can make is that someone is just like biased toward this conclusion. But as an agnostic, he's, I mean, you, you could maybe try to make that argument, but I, I don't think you could make it successfully. But it's just some, some important background information to keep in mind as he's talking about evidence. So that that's it. Just continue. Yeah. So, no, that, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Some people... That's, that's also another mistake, like you said, like if I'm arguing for Proposition P or arguing against Proposition P, that doesn't mean that I believe or disbelieve Proposition P. It just means I'm arguing, right? Uh, I could have countervailing evidence on some side. Anyway, setting that aside, uh, the data, let, let's pick a piece of data. So this will be like an orange jelly bean. Uh, that'll be the existence of conscious, free, moral agents, okay? Now, plausibly, conscious, free, moral agents have tremendous value, right? They, I mean, it's like, you know, we don't think that stepping on a rock is morally bad, but we do think, tend to think that, say, stepping on, like, a toddler, like, <laughs> or, like, torturing a toddler, that's pretty bad, okay? Um, and so, these kinds of beings have tremendous value. And moreover, um, the fact that they are free and conscious and that they can, they find themselves in a kind of arena in which they can make morally significant decisions that can facilitate, if God exists, that can facilitate a relationship like between these creatures and God, which is presumably one of the greatest goods possible. And so given the fact that the existence of conscious, moral, free agents, given, given the fact that this is incredibly valuable, has great goods, uh, we would, we would conclude on that, that well, God at least has some reason to produce them. God has some desire. God has some reason to produce them because God's perfect. God aims towards uh, things that are good and valuable and whatnot. Uh, but by contrast, under naturalism, it's not at all clear that you have this kind of probability raising effect or this kind of greater expectability. Why is that? Well, uh, by many naturalists' own lights, um, you know, our existence was not intended by anything. Nothing is trying to bring about profoundly valuable, sentient creatures. Uh, I mean, first of all, you have to get over a bunch of probability hurdles, right? You have to have a, a life-permitting universe. You have to have an evolutionary process that has to go on sufficiently long and with sufficiently detailed laws of nature that allow for a complex brain structure that can support consciousness and whatnot. Uh, you also have to have a kind of irreducible freedom that's responsive to reasons and whatnot. So you have to have a kind of, uh, you have to have all these sorts of probability hurdles. And naturalism doesn't seem to provide the resources to uh, raise the probability there and make it more expected than it would be on theism. And so, because this is uh, an orange jelly bean, it's more expected on the hypothesis of theism than it is on naturalism. It provides at least some evidence for theism. So that that's that, and that's just a counterexample to their claim that there's no evidence whatsoever. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I point out, because, okay, so someone pointed out in the live chat, there's like, okay, that's not the claim. The claim is not that there's, that there's no evidence. The claim is that there's no good evidence. That's someone, something that someone pointed out. You can maybe talk about that in a second. But I, I wanted to point out that a lot of times when people make this assertion, which does happen, there was a video that I actually responded to personally from the friendly atheist. What is his name? Hemant Mehta? Hemant? I think that's, I think that's the way to say his last name, Mehta. Uh, anyways, he did say that. He has like this video that's like two minutes long and it's like 20 different arguments for atheism. The first one is there's no evidence. Like that's all he says. One of the things I point out is that a lot of times when this is this argument is made or if you want to call it an argument, whenever the statement is made, it's normally not followed up by any evidence or any argument for the truth of this claim. So it's almost self-defeating in that sense. If there's no evidence for theism, yet when you claim this, you normally don't provide evidence for that claim it's kind of self-defeating in some way. And I like, to, I like to at least draw attention to that, that if you're going to make this claim, then maybe it's a good idea to say something a little bit more about it if you want to make the claim. So, so one, of the, one of the ways that someone will clarify is they'll say, well, there's, no, there's just no good evidence for theism. So what do you think about that? If they kind of, kind of twist it a little bit or just give a little bit more clarity, say there's no good evidence. As an agnostic, I mean, what do you think about that? Um... So uh, I don't quite understand. I feel like Peter Vandenwagen, like I don't understand what you're saying, but uh, <laughs> Which is like uh, the most, quite, <laughs> it's like the best know, comeback you can give understand. in a philosophical context. Yeah, I, I don't quite understand what this distinction is between good evidence and bad, ev bad ev evidence. Like, okay, so listen, evidence is probability raising, right? It, it's like I said, it's the orange jelly bean. It's like, again, consider our cases. Like, is the orange jelly bean good evidence or not? I mean, like, I can quantify it for you. Like, I can run the probability calculus and whatnot and, you know, put the, 
put the numbers in, but like evidence is evidence, right? Like if it either raises the probability of a hypothesis or not. Now, maybe what they're saying is, well, it doesn't raise the probability by a lot. You know, like it doesn't raise it See, so much. See, but then I don't think that that's it. what they're saying. I don't think it's like, oh, it just doesn't yeah. do it enough. I think they still want to say yeah. oh, it doesn't do it at all. Well, exactly. And, and <laughs> also, like the purpose of these arguments is not to raise the probability enough so as to make you like compel you to believe it or something. Rather, the purpose is indeed modest. It's just to say, hey, here's a piece of evidence. Let's take this into account when we're making our overall probability assessment of the right. world views. And so it's just one weight of evidence. And it, it might be stronger or weaker for some people, depending on, you know, their priors and all the other sorts of things. But the fact that it is evidence is a weight. It's a weight. We're no one's saying that it has to completely tip the scales. We're just saying that it's placed on a scale. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the the well. My third worst biggest mistake that atheists make. Uh, we spent how long do we spend on that? About fifteen minutes. So we will maybe spend a little bit less time on the rest. That involved <laughs> yeah. your demonstration. Everything else. Yeah, I had a demonstration. Uh, yeah. I also don't have that much to say in terms of like a you know, an illustration of how, how it goes, but I will reference a, a couple different times that I've seen it. And this is from my experience as well. So I've been doing apologetics, especially online for a long time. So coming up on a decade here. So I've seen a lot of, you know, different things on both sides. And that was one of the things we talked about before we did this is that like, it was difficult to find things that were sort of atheist specific. So some of the things that I'll talk about also apply to theists. And so it's kind of just like an attack on just bad thinking in general. Uh, so here's, and this again can apply to theists, but I think it's it's often seen in YouTube atheism. So my number third is, my, my third biggest problem, biggest thing, biggest mistake that atheists make is that they attack the weakest versions of arguments. And this is seen, uh, we'll go back to Stephen Woodford. He's produced a video on uh, critiquing the ontological argument and the thing that he critiques, the version he critiques, is Anselm's version. But there's been a lot of progress since Anselm. There's been a lot of different versions that have been offered. One of the most recent ones is from Yuji Nagasawa, who's got this argument, uh, this ontological argument that is very, It's it seems like he, it should have been proposed a, lot, a long time ago because it just seems so obvious. But he sort of developed this new version of the ontological argument that, uh, I mean, it's it's a lot different than the previous versions, but the point is that, you know, you if you want to really seriously critique an argument for the existence of God, don't just stop with like the weakest version, the easiest one to reject, the easiest one that's, that's that you can find the, the, the biggest amount of flaws in this argument. You know, you've got to also do the the research and go and find what, okay, so that, that version may not be very good, but have any other philosophers, any other theists developed this argument further, responded to those objections? Have they, you know, it's not just the different versions, it's also the responses to the objections. A lot of these responses, even to Pascal's wager, like the most common p responses to Pascal's wager, like the many gods objection, have been responded to in the literature by like a, a number of different theists, a number of different people, including Liz Jackson, who's been on the channel a bunch and even had a dialogue with Alex O'Connor, cosmic skeptic on that. So it's not just that they attack the weakest versions, it's that they're not really dealing with responses to these objections. I think that that's a really big problem. So it, do you have any thoughts on that before we move to, to your number two? No, that's really similar to something that I actually wanted to include on my list. And it was treating arguments I don't know, a family of arguments as one argument, right? So you get like videos on the ontological argument and yeah. it's like, I'm going to prove that it's wrong and the cosmological argument and, you know, all these other sorts of things. It's like, no, there's no such thing. I'm sorry to say, break it to you guys, but there's no such thing as the ontological argument, the cosmological argument. It's a family of arguments. Uh, like in, in ontological arguments, right? You got like a Maedolian ontological, Godelian, you got Anselmi. Anselm had like two or three, and some people, you know, like you've got a modal ontological, you got like symmetry break, like all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then in the cosmological side, you got like modal arguments from beginnings, you got like modal arguments from contingency, you've got, you know, first cause type arguments, both uh, hierarchically and linearly in the past. Like you've got all sorts of different arguments, and it's like, no, it's like you'll see a video by someone, and it'll be like, the cosmological argument commits a composition fallacy, and it's just like, I'm in pain, you know? <laughs> um, it's just like, it, it causes pain, and it's unfortunate. And again, like you said, this is worth emphasizing that it's on both sides, unfortunately. You know, some people will take right. the problem of evil and be like, hey, this, oh, atheist, man, that just was the... this, this, this atheist just stubbed his toe, and he's going to say, ah, therefore, no God. It's like, 
mm, let's be a little bit more charitable, guys. Yeah, that was the example I was going to give, is that a lot of theists will, will give a, a really weak version of the problem of evil and then respond to that. But we need to we need to be responding as theists to the best versions of it. So like from uh, his name is slipping in my mind. I've got it. I've got it. Thule. Michael Thule. Like he's he's got a debate book with uh, Alvin Planning and it's actually really, really good. You should go and read mm -hmm. that. It's called Knowledge of God. But like he's got one of the most formidable arguments of problem of evil and uh, William Bro and uh, Paul Draper. Dr. There's Draper, a lot yeah, of my yeah. boy. Your boy, he's got yeah. he's got one of the, the the best versions of the problem of evil, and that's that's the kind of stuff that we need to be dealing with. Is not just these surface level expositions of it, you know. So so it it definitely happens on both sides. But in in terms of uh, YouTube atheism, I think that I, I see that consistently and constantly in these these videos that get put out by some of the top atheists. So all right, let's move on to what is your number two? Uh, so my number two. Hopefully, I'm not stealing yours, but. Um... I said scientism and the devaluation of philosophy. Um, so on a lot of internet circles, uh, new atheist circles and whatnot, you kind of have this view known as scientism. Uh, and scientism, well, there are different versions of scientism. You have stronger versions and weaker versions. But oftentimes, they'll say something like, science is the only way that we can come to know things. Science is the only path to knowledge, the only uh, reliable path or the only good path, the only true path to knowledge. Uh, and, and what's... Well, there are about a trillion problems with that, but uh, I guess I'll just, you know, touch on two. I guess it's self, it's kind of self-undermining in two ways, and, you know, most of your audience will know this, but uh, it's self-undermining in two ways, right? So first, science itself couldn't possibly deliver the result that scientism is true, right? Like, you can't look at pressure gauges and be like, ah, 47, like, <laughs> 47, what is it, like, uh, like degrees, like, oh, no, therefore scientists, it's like, no, you can't look at a pressure gauge, you can't look at a Geiger counter, you can't look at a proton NMR machine, like, none of those will tell you that scientism is true. And so it couldn't possibly be the result or the deliverance of science. And so it couldn't possibly count as something you could know per scientism. And so that's a kind of self undermining. Uh, generally, you should avoid views that, uh, if true, entail that uh, no one could possibly know them or indeed, perhaps even be justified in accepting them. So that that's the first reason it's self defeating. Second reason it's self defeating is that, listen, science rests on a whole host of presuppositions, uh, that there is an external world, that there are other minds, uh, that our senses are reliable, <laughs> that our memory is reliable. None of these could even remotely be justified by the scientific method because the scientific method presupposes those, right? Like if you're collecting data, you have to assume that your memory is reliable, like that you wrote down a 5.2 and then a 5.3. And then when you go back to consult your data and run your analyses, you have to presuppose that your memory and your senses and whatnot are reliable. And so those cannot be a deliverance of science itself. And hence, these things cannot be justified by science. And so if scientism is true, you cannot even know these sorts of things. You cannot even be justified in them. And I mean, that just obviously collapses the very foundations of science itself and pretty much all of our knowledge. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it gives you a kind of radical skepticism. Uh, and then I guess finally, um, it just, scientism makes literally zero sense from an epistemological standpoint. So, uh, I mean, we have all sorts of ways of knowing things that have nothing to do, well, that don't have much to do with the scientific method, like rational intuition. How do you know that one equals one or that nothing can be both red all over and green all over at the same time in the same respect? Like no scientific experience. It's like, oh, here's a red thing. This isn't green all over. Here is a green thing. Like, no, you don't do that. Uh, instead, you could just see it. You could just see it through your mind's eye, as it were. Uh, also, you have testimony, right? So uh, Cameron, if you told me that, hey, uh, my daughter was really happy today when she came home from school. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, where's your scientific? It's like, no, like I can still gain knowledge on the basis of your testimony. Testimony can provide some evidential uh, weight in favor of views. And then finally, introspection, right? How do I know that I'm having a good time right now? Because I could just, I feel it, right? You know, <laughs> that's how I know. And that I don't have, you know, that's not acquired by science or anything. So it's just epistemologically dead. Like it makes zero sense. You open up any epistemology textbook and you will see that this is just so wrong. Anyway, I'm done. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you actually did steal my second one. So this is actually good. So we got the same one for, for number two. And my number two, the way that I framed it was just bad epistemology. So yeah. you talked about scientism. The two that I had to, to talk about was local skepticism and uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, which uh, yeah. depending on what you mean by that, it, it, it is actually true. And I'll talk about that in a second. But let's talk about local skepticism versus global skepticism. So I did a stream again with Liz Jackson, which you guys should definitely go check out. We talked about the difference between local skepticism in the domain of, say, religion as opposed to global skepticism, which is uh, what skeptics back in the day, like philosophical skeptics were really after was like 
uh, Descartes back in the day, he was like, I want to be skeptical of everything I can be skeptical of and then start from like my most basic foundational point and then go from there and try to build up my knowledge base uh, from, from what I know that I know. And so that, that was basically the sort of the right way to go about it, at least in his mind back in the day. But the difference between, I think, what happens online today with skeptic is that with skeptics is that they'll be super super hyper skeptical with with uh, respect to one domain say religion so they'll be super skeptical of any kind of testimony from you know say the bible or anything else and they won't allow any kind of evidence in this one domain but then when you move to a different domain say just in your everyday life when you gave the example of like if i told you that my daughter was happy when she came home from school like you wouldn't necessarily you, you probably wouldn't be skeptical of that even though i just told you you know on the basis of testimony that's the only evidence available to you is just through testimony you'd be like okay that's pretty good evidence for this for this claim you know and so uh i think that that's that's really important to to point out is that there's uh, one of the biggest mistakes is kind of applying their skepticism inconsistently. So there's a kind of local skepticism that's a big problem. So it, it's, a, it's actually okay, I think, to be a skeptic, but what you need to do is be consistent. So if you are just hyper skeptical with respect to the domain of religion, then just apply that same level of skepticism to your other beliefs and kind of just see where you end up. So if you may end up, a lot of uh, philosophers have actually argued this, is that you're going to end up having to be skeptical of a lot including pretty much all of your scientific knowledge. You think you know about science because let's be honest, most of the people that are watching this, you're not a scientist. You don't actually go out and perform the experiments. And if you are a scientist, you're probably a scientist with respect to one little tiny microcosm of science. So you may do experiments in say microbiology or something related to like genetic mutation or something like that, but you're not a, a you know an expert in uh, tectonic plates or something something completely outside of your field. And so uh, you're going to be relying, no matter wh who you are, even if you're a scientist, you're going to be relying on testimony for the vast majority of your scientific knowledge. And so if, but if, you know, if you apply your, your, the same level of skepticism that you apply in the, in the, the, in the domain of religion, I'm trying to talk too fast today. If you apply the same level of skepticism in the domain that you apply in the domain of religion to other domains, then you may end up with almost zero knowledge of anything. And a lot of people will say that that's like a bad consequence of skepticism so it's kind of like a a morian shift type argument it's like that's that implies too much skepticism i know that i've got two hands i know that i have you know i i know that evolution is true a lot of people think that that's true so if you're a skeptic and you think that you know that common descent is a real thing ask yourself like how do i actually know that is it is it because i've performed some kind of experiment no i probably read it in like a textbook and you're basing that on the on the testimony of other scientists so yeah, uh, selective skepticism or local skepticism, I think that's a big problem. Uh, the other one was extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but uh, do you have any thoughts on what I just said about skepticism? Just a quick thought. I mean, even when someone is an expert scientist in one area, like your experiment, you almost there, there's pretty much no such thing as like, again, there are some counterexamples, but there's pretty much no such thing as a lone wolf scientist. You have teams, right? You have teams, you have your lab, and oftentimes you'll have student assistants and you know you have your entire team when you work on a paper and whatnot and that itself that even the, the process of one experiment uh even one day at the lab right you're relying on a whole host of testimonial evidence you have your assistant go and make the dilutions of the you know of the solution and whatnot and you say did you dilute this by a factor of 10 they're going to be like yep i performed the calculations and i did it you're trusting their testimony and whatnot, and perhaps also, you know, their your past experience with this person and so on. But still, um, even in the case of one scientific experiment, you are relying on all all these different, you know, ordinary methods like uh, common sense and uh, testimony and memory and all these other sorts of things. So, yeah, I'll, I want to say one la quick thing about memory, and I, I watched a video of this guy who has. Just like I think the worst, case, one of the worst cases of of memory of short term memory loss that's known to man. And uh, I was watching this YouTube video about it. It's so sad. He his short term memory is so so poor. And it could be the result of some uh, accident or something that he had. But basically, you can't have a conversation with him because by the time you finish your sentence, he's already forgotten what what you said at the very beginning. So he'll just kind of just like talk and ramble, and you think you're having a conversation with him. But what I think that shows is the pervasiveness of memory is that we just sort of take it for granted that even like the very beginning of this stream that we did, Joe, like. 
I'm relying on my memory that uh, of the certain, you know, the different things that we've already talked about in order to be able to get through this stream, even by the end of the sentence that I'm talking right now, like I'm still remembering this, you know, how I kind of started this and where I'm going to go. And so memory is so pervasive and there's nothing you could do to get out of just having to rely on it. Like you just have to rely on your, you know, your faculty of memory in order to be able to, to, to function as a human being in this world. And there's no amount of scientific experiment or data or whatever that you could use to try to justify that. You just got to rely on it without argument. And I think that that's really interesting to think about. Okay, uh, the, the next one is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Is that what it is? Yeah, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So the uh, first thing that's wrong with that is that a lot of people, uh, they don't really define what they mean by extraordinary. And so once you do that, I think that depending on the way that you define that and the way that it's sort of actually formalized, if you get clear on what you're, what you're saying, that's one of the things that philosophy tries to do, or at least analytic philosophy. I'll talk a little good about analytic philosophy for a second. Good thing about analytic philosophy is that they try to get clear on like what someone is saying so that you can really analyze what they're saying and whether or not it's true. And so if you actually define your terms, I did a, a show with uh, Tim McGrew, who's a sort of expert in logic and probability and everything. And uh, we, we analyzed this claim and we looked at uh, uh, one way to look at it as uh, extraordinary. So basically what it breaks down to is if you define these terms in, I think, the, the way that they ought to be defined, then basically all you're going to be doing is ending up giving the sort of a Bayesian probability calculus. And so if you have a claim that has a sort of really low prior probability, which is, I think, the right way to interpret the first part of this claim is an extraordinary claim. I think that really just means a claim that has a really low prior probability, then you need some good evidence in order to overcome or outweigh that initial improbability that you've got in the prior there. And so you've got to have some really good evidence to overcome it. But the mistake I think that happens with this is that you, the assumption here, and this is this is just based on our sort of, I think, natural intuitions about the world is that, uh, and, and I think it's also sort of propounded by like movies and TV shows and stuff, is that like you're expecting in order to overcome some initial improbability, you're expecting to get like one piece of super good evidence. Like you want, you know, in, in the case of someone who's uh, being accused of murder, you want like, you know, video evidence or DNA evidence or something like that in order to like say that this person is guilty. But in a lot of cases, you don't have just one big piece of evidence. You've got a whole bunch of small pieces of evidence that sort of all together end up overcoming the initial improbability that you started with on the first side of the equation. And so that's just a really important thing to keep in mind here is that what one big piece of evidence can do, a whole bunch of small pieces of evidence can do the exact same thing. And this is, you can see this very clearly once you actually do the calculations and probabilities theory. So that that's one of the things that Tim pointed out, which I think is just really, really good. And that's a mistake I think a lot of atheists make, but also Christians too. Uh, and you can do that with the problem of evil too. Uh, anyways, Thoughts, Joe, and then we'll move to the, the top. I uh, the don't top have anything. Mistakes. I don't have anything to add on that. That was good. Um, I mean, yeah, like you said, oftentimes, well, it, it depends on how you define extraordinary. And once you really kind of rigorously define it, I think it's just going to boil down to Bayes' theorem. And they're just pointing out that if you have a really low ratio of the priors, then your likelihood ratio is going to have to be pretty high to make up for that. Which is like, okay, thanks for telling me a basic fact about probability theory. I appreciate it. Yeah. And then you've got to actually do the, the, the work of pointing out that the, the prior probability actually is low, which is a sort of assumption that a lot of people make. And then you've also got to argue that the evidence doesn't overcome the prior, uh, which, is, which is another thing that just doesn't sort of happen. So it's important to actually like, instead of just relying on a slogan and saying that like, okay, claim, you know, claim victory and like all my work is done because I said this one thing. No, you haven't even really begun because you got to define your terms. You've actually got to defend both sides of the equation that you've got a low prior and that the evidence doesn't overcome the prior. And uh, a lot of times that doesn't happen. Well, okay, that's something, well, that's something about th that's pervasive in all this, right? The sort of sloganeering, right. which is on both sides, right? You just have these one liners that you think kind of just, you know, settle things. It's like, no, let's roll up our sleeves. Let's really try to, like, I don't know, pursue the truth here, love one another while we're doing that, and, you know, just stop with the slogans. So. Stop with the slogans, please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's our slogan. Is, uh, <laughs> our slogan is stop the slogans. Yes. Okay. Uh, someone said, where can I get your t-shirt? They're talking <laughs> about yours. 
Uh, yeah, so I made this myself. I should probably like try to sell these or something. But on the right sleeve, it's got the universal quantifier. Um, and then right here, it's got the existential quantifier. And then right here, we've got the phi for philosophy. Um, that's all. But yeah, I just I customized it on like logo sportswear or something. Like, <laughs> uh, Yeah, make a Teespring store. It's free to I do should. that and you can make money. Okay, uh, what, is your, what is your number one biggest mistake that atheists make? Okay, so uh, this is the one where I took some notes on it. So uh, I might just be able to present this for a little while. Uh, but it's lack theism. Okay, so um, by it's lack be good. theism, I, yeah, by lack I'm a, theism, I'm a, I mean. Defining... I'm going to put you full screen. <laughs> okay, so by lack theism, uh, what I mean by that is people defining atheism in some way or another as a lack of belief. Now, let's be clear, first of all, that we can define terms however we like. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> I noticed Sorry, it right I'll... when you were going, like, no, it's all good. <laughs> so let's be clear that we can define terms however we like, but also let's be clear that definitions really, really matter. So right now I've got Michael Humer, who's a great philosopher. Uh, this is his 2021 book, Knowledge, Reality, and Value. It's quite good. Um, I just want to talk, he, he gives some really nice reflections on um, the importance of definitions because I can tell people, I mean, I can hear people right now, like furiously typing, saying, oh, I could define atheism however I want. Like, okay, yes, you can, but... Okay, so to correctly analyze a term, I'm reading from humor, to correctly analyze a term, you have to give a set of conditions that correctly classifies objects in all possible circumstances. In assessing this, we appeal to linguistic intuitions. That is, if normal English speakers would, when fully informed, call something, let's say, knowledge, uh, then your analysis should classify it as knowledge. If not, then not. Uh, and so, uh, he goes on to say, this might seem unimportant to you, right? Who cares about semantics? Why not just stipulate how you intend to use a word and forget about the standard English usage? Well, there are three reasons for not doing that. First, this causes confusion for other people who are familiar with the ordinary English use of the word. Second, ordinary usage usually serves important functions. Human beings over the millennia have certain ways, have, excuse me, have found certain ways of grouping and distinguishing objects, that is, certain conceptual schemes, to be useful and interesting. These useful conceptual schemes are embodied in our language. Current usage reflects, in a way, the accumulated wisdom of many past generations. And finally, third, it is actually almost impossible to escape from the conceptual scheme that you've learned from your linguistic community. And he goes on to talk about the importance of that. But this is all to say that, yes, while you can define terms however you like, it's actually really, really, really important that we kind of get a correct definition. And there is a notion of correct and incorrect definitions. If I define knowledge as true belief, that's an incorrect, that, that's just incorrect. It, knowledge is not true belief because you can just make a guess and you could just happen to be right. And so you can have a true belief, but that obviously doesn't count as knowledge. So there are correct definitions and incorrect definitions. And I'm just gonna try to point out that lack theism is probably an incorrect definition of atheism. So first I need to talk about what belief is. So by belief, uh, I mean, and philosophers mean, and most people mean, affirming some proposition or statement to be true, okay? That is taking it to accurately represent reality, okay? Philosophers call belief a kind of propositional attitude. It's like an attitude that you take toward a proposition. You affirm it to be true. So uh, let's, let's take a first analysis of atheism as lack theism, okay? So this first analysis is going to say S for someone S, S is an atheist if and only if S lacks a belief in God. Okay, so there are some counterexamples to this. So firstly, a subatomic particle, right, lacks a belief in God, uh, but it's not an atheist, right? Uh, if you think subatomic particles are atheists, well, then you have to say that the number of atheists in existence is on the order of 10 to the power of 80, uh, and that's a bit difficult for Pew surveys. Um, uh, also, zygotes, fetuses, and babies, right? These are human beings that lack belief in God, but it seems implausible to call them atheists. Uh, again, Pew surveys don't have to add 400,000 new atheists every day to their data. That's how many babies are born every day. Uh, and also, they don't have to like consider how many eggs are being fertilized uh, per day in order to estimate the number of new zygotes coming into existence. So uh, we shouldn't define an atheist as something which lacks a belief in God. So let's move on to a second analysis that tries to avoid those counterexamples. This is what this is what good analytic philosophy does. Oftentimes, you find counterexamples of something, but then you try to bolster it, right? You try to strengthen it and try to, you know, defend it from those counterexamples that try to attack it. So here's the second analysis. Uh, so S is an atheist if and only if S is capable of forming beliefs and yet lacks a belief in God. Ah, so we're getting better, right? Because uh, the babies and the zygotes and whatnot are not capable, at least directly, of forming 
of the kind of propositional beliefs, and neither are subatomic particles. So we get rid of those counterexamples. But there are still many problems. So uh, consider someone who thinks that there is substantial evidence for God's existence and also substantial evidence against God's existence. So suppose, for instance, that they sign a 50% probability to the proposition God exists and a 50% probability to the proposition God does not exist. So is this person, person an atheist? Well, to me, it seems not. Uh, they literally think God's existence is as likely as God's non-existence. But okay, suppose you think that such a person is an atheist, okay? Uh, there are still three problems that I think remain for this particular analysis. First, it collapses the distinction between agnostic and atheist. I mean, just think about it. Like, what could possibly count as an agnostic under this definition? I mean, for anyone capable of forming beliefs, they either believe in God or they lack a belief in God. If the former, they count as a theist, uh, but if the latter, then per this definition, they're automatically an atheist. Uh, th there's simply no room for agnostics on this picture. They just don't fit in. And that shows that the definition is faulty, since any carving up of the conceptual space needs to accommodate a distinctly agnostic position. Uh, the second problem for this, uh, or the second further problem for this analysis, is that uh, suppose that this person that we're talking about, this kind of neutral 50-50 person, suppose they take Pascal's wager and they make a practical commitment to a life-serving God. So they go to church services, they say their prayers and all the other stuff, but they still think God's existence and non-existence are equally probable. Uh, and so they lack a belief in God. Now, I don't think that they're atheists, even though per this definition, they would count as atheists, right? It just seems obviously wrong to say that they're atheists. They're literally going to church, they're praying and so on. They have a kind of practical commitment, but they don't have that doxastic aspect. The third problem is that suppose that we alter the story that I just gave of the neutral atheist. Uh, so suppose that we say that the person thinks the evidence is roughly counterbalanced, but slightly, ever so slightly weighs in favor of theism. Uh, so in this case, uh, they could assign, let's say, a 52% probability to God's existence and a 48% probability to God's non-existence. Now, this person obviously doesn't believe in God, right? Like, they don't represent the world as being one in which God exists. They do not affirm as true the proposition that God exists. Instead, they merely think it's, like, ever so slightly more probable than not. Uh, but uh, they wouldn't go so far as to say that they actually believe the proposition to be true full stop. So uh, the definition that we're considering would count this person as an atheist. But I think that that's just a mistake, right? Someone who thinks God's existence is literally more probable than not should not count as an atheist under your definition. Uh, so um, those are some initial problems. I have six more problems. They're shorter than the one I just gave, but I have six more problems for this. I'm going to turn it over to you, Cameron, to, <laughs> to see if you have any questions on that. Six? Uh, no, let's continue. Because, I mean, I, ha I just have a couple things to say, but uh, and okay. I've even done a show with this with... Uh, Chris Gadsden, which was a really good show. You guys should go check it out. Uh, I think, I, I can't remember the title of it, but yeah, continue your six and then I'll, I'll talk okay. a little bit. Okay, so um, first, uh, it is this kind of definition of atheism. It's contradicted by actual usage in contemporary philosophy and in particular philosophy of religion. And these are the experts on how to properly define the concepts in question. So for instance, Paul Draper, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, he points out how he points out that atheism means the negation of theism, the denial of the existence of God. Um, so I, I, that was a direct quote from him. You can also look at uh, atheism is not defined as a lack of belief, but instead as belief in the proposition that God does not exist. In the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, the second edition, that's in 2006, you can find it in the Oxford Companion to Philosophy, the Blackwell Dictionary of Western Philosophy, the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and so on. So uh, that's the first point. The second point is that the, a term already exists for those who lack a belief in God. It's non-theist. Uh, so, for instance, Charles Taliaferro, Paul Draper, and Philip Quinn, uh, in one of their Blackwell companions, distinguish between atheists and other non-theist perspectives. The term non-theist is already a far more precise and standard word to describe those who lack a belief in God. It can also accommodate agnostics and whatnot and, and innocence, uh, to use Graham Oppie's phrase. Third, uh, Draper gives, in his Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, an argument against conceiving atheism as a lack of belief. So, um, the argument is, one, it makes sense to say that theism is true or false and to argue for or against theism. Two, but it doesn't make sense to say that a psychological state is true or false and it doesn't make sense to like argue for a psychological state or against a psychological state. And so it follows that theism is not a psychological state. But, so Draper argues, atheism should be defined in terms of theism. And if theism is not a psychological state and atheism is defined solely in terms of theism, well then it follows that atheism itself is not a psychological state. But if atheism is merely the state of lacking a belief in God, then it is a psychological state. 
So by modus tollens, it follows that atheism is not the state of lacking a belief in God. It's the third problem. Fourth problem. Draper. Uh, it seems <laughs> exactly, I know. <laughs> He's like dropping the mic here. Um, so the fourth thing is that it seems plausible that atheism should be a direct answer to the most important metaphysical question in philosophy of religion. Is there a God? As Paul Draper writes, quote, there are only two possible direct answers to that question. Yes, which is theism, and no, which is atheism. Answers like, I don't know, no one knows, I don't care, I don't have a psychological state of affirming the proposition, and so on, are not direct answers to that question, end quote. So that's a fourth consideration. A fifth consideration, uh, if, athe if an atheist is someone who lacks a belief in God, well, then what is atheism? Well, uh, is it the proposition that there is no God? Well, if so, then we have a really strange asymmetry in our definitions of atheist and atheism, right? If the former is merely a description of one's psychological state, well, then the latter, it seems weird to say that it's an actual claim that God doesn't exist. Uh, and so instead, it seems that we'd have to define atheism as merely the state of lacking a belief in God. That's really the only way to be consistent with your definition of an atheist as someone who lacks a belief in God. But if atheism is merely the state of lacking a belief in God, then there can be no arguments against atheism. Arguments only conclude to propositions or claims. You can't have an argument that concludes, therefore, the state of lacking a belief in God is false, or therefore, the state of lacking a belief in God is true. That just doesn't make any sense. But then we get the absurd result that an argument for theism, like with a conclusion that God exists, is not an argument against atheism. And that seems really weird. Um, and so, uh, anyway, I I'll just stop there. Uh, there are so many problems. No, there are more don't problems, stop. by the way. I had to, I had to cut off. Don't stop. <laughs> don't stop. Give me more. No, we're good. We're good. Well, you do. You only got five. Give me, what's the sixth one? Um, let's see. Oh. No, it turns out that I, I must have deleted it because I went way over. I I, oh. <laughs> I had to shave this down, by the way, because there are more considerations. I had like quotes <laughs> from different encyclopedia of philosophy and things like that, but I had to uh. cut them down. But in total, actually, I guess I'll just summarize. I've given a total of, I believe, seven, um, uh, seven different problems. So first, defining atheism as lack of belief. These are seven there problems. There was at least eight. First, okay. So if you, first, well, if you, if you include humors, like his, his three different reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well... First, it succumbs to counterexamples like the cases of the Pascalian agnostic uh, and the agnostic with a very slight lean towards theism. Uh, second, it collapses the distinction between atheists and agnostics. Third, it is contradicted by actual usage in contemporary philosophy and in particular philosophy of religion who are the experts on defining the concept in question. Fourth, the term non-theist is already a far more precise and standard word to describe those who lack a belief in God. Fifth, atheism should be defined in terms of theism. This is Draper's argument, and since theism is not a psychological state, neither is atheism. Sixth, it redirects discussion away from the metaphysical issue of God's existence and towards the irrelevant issue of one's psychological state. And seventh, it entails absurdly that an argument for theism is not an argument against atheism. So those are my seven reasons. There are more, by the way, but... Okay, uh, the only thing that I had to, to add, and in, in this is, I think, going back to, to humor, basically, you can have a correct or incorrect definition. And uh, so here's uh, one of the examples that I think Chris gave in, in the interview that I did with him. It, so basically, if you want to say in a conversation that a horse is anything with wheels, then you're just wrong. Like, you've got a wrong, you know, you're... It's not just that you're using a term in a weird way. You're just straight up wrong. Like a horse does not have wheels. And so uh, I, I just think that's a, a sort of interesting thing to think about is that you can have a, a, a sort of incorrect usage of a term. Another thing is just that like, uh, okay, so if if we can just avoid all of this by saying, okay, atheism just means it's, it's a lack of belief in God and that's just sort of what it is, um, then I think that what, is happening is that you're just a bad communicator because that is not it, it, what we're talking about when we're having a discussion about God's existence. We are operating within a certain, uh, is, is language game the wrong term to use here? But we're operating within a certain context. So like if, if I was as, as a photographer, if I was to go into a, a photography studio and start using a bunch of photography terms in super weird ways, then that would be a really, that, that'd be bad. You know, that'd look bad on me. Like I would look like a complete idiot if I started going in there and referred to a light as like, you know, if I, if by light I meant mouse or something like that. It's like, what, what are you talking about, right? So when you enter into a certain domain, then I think you've got to play by those certain rules. And I think that that, so if you're not doing that, then that just looks bad on you. And I think in, in, in one sense, it looks bad is that you're just a bad communicator. So you just don't, 
I don't know, you're kind of like a, an anarchist when it comes to, to language rules. And I don't know, maybe, maybe that's tied to some kind of psychological thing you got going on. You just got to <laughs> rebel. I don't know. Uh, those are, those are really the only two things I got to say about that, but we haven't even talked about my top, my top thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking is, forward to gonna, this. Let's hear it. It's, it's not as, uh, it's not as crazy as yours. So my, my number one is, and this is like the top thing that I see consistently. You, you kind of mentioned it when you were saying your second one, but you didn't really focus on it. So I was happy that I could actually just say it. Uh, so basically it's just a failure to care about good philosophy. I think that this is just so rampant and it's again this mine mine are not like specific things that that atheists are or because I think a lot of Christians have bad epistemology I think that a lot of Christians attack weak versions of arguments and I think that a lot of Christians fail to care about good philosophy but what I've seen consistently from atheists that I've interacted with and atheist youtubers is that they don't look at and it's not just like you're not okay so someone like Luke Barnes He's got, you know, probably the best version of the fine tuning argument. It's not just that they're not interacting with someone like Luke Barnes when they try to critique the fine tuning argument. It's not just that. It's that they don't even know the name Paul Draper. They don't even know the name Graham Oppie in a lot of cases, right? So they're not even utilizing the people that are on their own side, who are the smartest people, who have given the most rigorous arguments, the best arguments. And it's like, to me, I just don't understand that. When I was getting into philosophy, into apologetics, the first thing I wanted to do was like, who are the best people? Where's the best argument? I want to know like who's given the most rigorous version of the fine-tuning argument, of the cosmological argument. I want to know what the best version is by the smartest person. And I want to I want to like know that one. And I want to, if that's the argument that's the best argument, I want to not only do I want to know that argument, I want to know what are the best responses to this argument by the smartest atheists or by the smartest other people. And I just don't see that. And it's not, it's not again. This one, and this is just, uh, you, you didn't really do this, so you, you probably did a better job than I did. But this is not just something that, that atheists do, but it's just it's something that everyone does. And I just don't understand it. But if we, if we, instead of doing that, if we raised up and started focusing on the best, started focusing on the Michael Tooley version of the problem of evil, the Paul Draper, different, he's got like seven different versions of the problem of evil in his, in his work. If we started focusing on that, oh my gosh, everyone would be so much better off. We'd be able to make so much more, uh, I don't know about progress, but we just, it, it would just be, I say progress because I think the, the real progress actually happens in the literature and by the, the actual philosophers. But it, it would just be, it would make for such a better um, atmosphere. Maybe that's the right term to use. So that's that's my rant. I'll get off my soapbox. What uh, do you have to say about that? Yeah, no, I was I was hinting at that in my second uh, point. I like scientism and the devaluation of philosophy. I didn't go much into the devaluation of philosophy, but I, I feel like it's almost like pervasive in just behind a lot of these things, right? Like lack theism, right? They are like, I don't know. It's like the I think the sixth point. I'm actually remembering what I deleted. Um, I was gonna. I was. My point was. Well, let me cut you off. It, let me, yeah, as you're thinking on. about that, let me cut you off because uh, I, I I said this in our uh, our Facebook chat. I was like, the the biggest problem with atheism is just Ricky Gervais, and Ricky Gervais basically embodies what I just said. He cares about no, like no good philosophy. It, it, everything he says is basically a slogan. Something he it's something that can be debunked within like thirty seconds of thinking about it rigorously. And it's like he he just embodies like all of the worst of new atheism and i think it all kind of boils down to and maybe you were just about to talk to the uh, talk about this it all kind of boils down to this just like devaluation of philosophy and good thinking and like yeah yeah no i that <laughs> it's so true that I, I when you sent that message I'm like yep um but like i i now remember the sixth point that we were talking that you were asking me about i deleted it and it it was the, i think that lack theism is actually potentially destructive to natural atheology, where you can define natural atheology as just the project, you know, natural theology is the project of giving arguments from reason for God's existence. Natural atheology is just the project of giving reasons to think there is no God, right? Um, and uh, I. E. is a problem of evil. Yeah, like the problem of evil, problem of hiddenness, all the, like Philippe Leone has this huge list and you know, you can talk and on and on about stuff like that. but. 
you know, the, the point is, is that lack theism, I don't know, it's almost like it's getting people to think like, no, atheism is merely this lack as his negative position. I don't need to have arguments for my position. It's kind of the default. It's like the burden of proof is on you. It's like, but like, <laughs> meanwhile, natural atheologists like um, Draper and, you know, Oppie, like they're rolling up their sleeves and like, listen, I've got this extreme, you look at my philosophy paper and it's like half math because it's like Bayesian probability and it's like evil and it's like dude like this is what natural atheology should be that is like antithetical to your lack theism right because your lack theism is just purely negative enterprise i think it distracts people from like the really good work that's going on in natural atheological circles it's being published you know just like good theistic philosophy is being done being published like every quarterly you know so it, this devaluation of philosophy is kind of implicit in a lot of the things that we've said like it's behind the scientism i think it's probably behind the lack theism it's probably behind you know some of our other problems like the extraordinary claims of extraordinary evidence like this is all just like um a, a polemic in favor of doing good philosophy so <laughs> I, w I was just thinking about because I've heard you I've heard you do this a couple of times today, but I think the reason why you're so good at your Swinburne interpretation, your Swinburne impersonation, is because you actually do some of that yourself. I know I actually yeah. noticed that in myself when I. <laughs> Matthew used to say. Exactly. Timothy Timothy you Williamson or whatever he does it as well. He does this like, it's like it's like so good. <laughs> Oh, give your, uh, the guy that I didn't know, like I, I hadn't heard of him, do that oh, impression. Oh, Slavoj Zizek? Oh no, this is going to be, this is going to haunt me. <laughs> I'll, give me a send. Okay, let's just say like capitalism. Okay, um, well think about, think about it to yourself. Don't say it out loud because I'll just let the audience know. We're about to turn to Q&A. So I've already got some pulled up in the queue here. But if you have a question and you want to talk about uh, anything related to the three biggest mistakes that atheists make, if you want to give your own, then I'll definitely try to pull it up in the uh, in the conversation today. We're going to go probably for how much time do you have? Um, I've got probably 20 minutes. OK, so we'll try to get to as many of these as, as we can. But uh, we've we've got a bunch of super chats that were sent in as well. So I'll get oh, to nice. those first. Yeah. So, uh, OK, are you ready? Yeah, um, I'm totally going to regret doing this, but uh, so this is Slavoj Zizek. Uh, he debated Jordan Peterson, and anyway, he, he's kind of like a public intellectual of sorts. Um, yeah, anyway, he, he has this uh, hilarious accent, and it's like, um, it, it's like capitalism, but it, it's like, it's got the Marxist, and they, they concentrate on the, the impoverished, lower class the the sort of proletariat right and the proletariat <laughs> okay i'm done <laughs> uh so i didn't i didn't know who that was when you first sent me that and then you ha and then you sent me a clip of him which people need to go look it up it's just so good this is just he's like tier. always snort. he's like it's <laughs> capitalist <laughs> ideology <laughs> All right, let's get to some questions. Uh, okay, uh, someone said, and this was not a super chat, but it's worth pointing out. So someone said, can you clip, please clip the lack theism argument? Yes, I'll try to clip that out and put that in a, a separate video. Uh, here's another one from Abi, kind of along the same lines. That quotation you read was so good. I think they were talking about the humor quote. Well, humor is amazing. Everyone go check out Michael Humor. He's not paying me, but he should. Um, no, <laughs> Michael Humor, uh, anyway, he's a great philosopher. All of his books are so accessible. Like they're written with such great clarity. It kind of reminds me of Phaser. Phaser is a great writer in terms of clarity. And Michael Humer is also extremely clear. And yeah, I mean, this is pretty cheap. It's one of his recent books. And check out any of his other books. He has a nice defense of moral realism, for instance, in his ethical intuitionism book. All right, here's one. Uh, the The way that I my software works is that I don't have them in chronological order. I don't know why my software doesn't do that. So I'll just get through them in, in the order that they've got them here. So here's one from Trinity Radio. What's up, Braxton? He says, uh, oh, oh, and thanks for your super <laughs> chat, dude. He says, I always think Joe's setup looks like he's in front of the door to his hotel room, and I keep <laughs> waiting for housekeeping to open the door, interrupting the stream. Yep, college life, my dude. So like, I'm in my dorm right now, so it, it is kind of like a hotel. But you know, I I was actually just holding up my cereal for <laughs> before we went on because it's like everything's near me. But hey, uh, you know, the semester's over soon. I'll be back at my home studio, which is my basement. Um, nice or your parents' basement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, here we go. Darius Phyllis says, uh, "Thank you for your super chat. Gotta love Joe. He's amazing. Thank you for bringing him on, Cameron." Yes, I know Darius, so hey, how's it going? 
Yeah. Uh, so one last time, if you don't know who Joe is, he's he's got a channel called Majesty of Reason, spelled with a G, uh, a G and definitely go <laughs> check out his his work. Uh, I've got it linked in the description of this video. He's uh, it, it's not with a G, it's with a J. That's the correct way to spell Majesty. But uh, go check him out. He's got really good stuff. Uh, even though he's an agnostic, and he'll eventually he'll be a Christian, but uh, definitely go check him out. Okay, here's one from uh, Oscar. He says, I've never heard an atheist that expands it in any other sense than the Pryor's version. Also never heard someone say you cannot present a cumulative case. I think they're talking about the uh, the accre. So, Oscar, you may have not, but I've seen it. I've seen people who just kind of like give the phrase and then do nothing else. And I think that once you actually kind of lay it out, again, kind of what Joe said, it's like if what you're ultimately doing is just like telling everyone, hey, probability theory is a thing. <laughs> okay uh but and then if we're, if they're also allowing for a cumulative case then great but then why are you saying the phrase in the first place what kind of work are you trying to do with the phrase when you when you put it out there and that's that's i think ultimately what it what it's gonna come down to is what are the reasons this person is saying this thing and if it's just to like iterate some kind of like probability calculus then like thank you uh but what what you know why were you saying that in the first place, but then you've also got to do, I think the work of like, if you are going to say this thing, you got to do the work of showing that the prior probability is low, got to do the work of showing that the base factor can't overcome the, in, the initial improbability from the, from the prior. So yeah. Uh, it, it, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess we should just reiterate that like there is a sense in which both you and I perfectly well accept that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's the sense that we disambiguated when we're, you know, we're trying to precisify these terms in terms of the priors and likelihood ratio. So we both is precisify that. a um, word though, Joe is precisify. It is. A it word. is yes. <laughs> uh, I think precisification is also a word. I love it. It's like, Ooh, it's so great. Anyway, um, <laughs> it tingles, it tingles me. <laughs> I shouldn't say this. Uh, this you is definitely supposed to be like shouldn't. PG or something. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but yeah, so I mean, it, it's a good point that, uh, like, if they expand on it in that direction, like, sure, we then we agree with them, right? Like, we we agree with it. But the point is, is that, at least speaking personally, right? I can only speak from what I've seen. Um, I've never heard them expand on it at all, as you said. It's typically sloganeering. Um, I I'd be surprised if you sent me a video and they're like. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And by that, I mean, and then they show this like Bayes theorem and then they're talking about like the priors. <laughs> and it's like, okay, if you could show me one, then I'll, maybe I'll be like, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Like Ricky Gervais has, has said it. We'll go back to him. Like he said it, I don't know, a thousand times on the internet. You, you can just look up like basically any video of him that's popular on YouTube talking about atheism and like that'll pop up. And he doesn't really use Bayes theorem. He doesn't like clarify. He doesn't precisify what he's saying in terms of uh, in Bayesian terms. He doesn't do that. Uh, but I think go, going back to like the cumulative case, I th and it's not just an atheist thing. This is again, just sort of going to, I'm hitting both sides here, but I think that on both of us, like we just are really bad at weighing a cumulative case because we think that we've got to have some like big argument. You know, we need one cosmological argument that's successful. And that's going to be the one that's going to like weigh us in favor of, of theism. But I think that we're really bad at like, okay, this argument gets us someplace, this argument gets us a little bit further, this argument gets... And then, like, weighing it all up, I think it's just... And maybe this is a fact about our psychology, is that, like, I don't know, we we just don't tend to think logically in, in probability terms all the time, and I think that that's happening on both sides. But in particular, I think atheists just don't really appreciate what different arguments can do, even if it's just, like, a little bit of evidence this way, a little bit of evidence, and then when you put it all together we may just not feel like the sense of the evidence that it's in the impact that it's having, even though on paper it'd be a whole lot higher, but we just don't feel like it's anything. And so we all, I think kind of like just, I don't know, psychologically we want some big piece of evidence. So I, I think that's just really important to point out. I mean, it's, again, it's not just an atheist thing, but anybody can, I think, fall prey to this. And there's, I think there's probably... I don't know of any off offhand, but there are prob there, there are uh, cases in probability theory where you're like, should you do this? Should you do that? Based on the probabilities, and a lot of people like get those answers wrong probabilistically. You probably know one off the top of your head. I don't know any. Yeah, but no, I, yeah, we're, um, like there are studies that show that like we're just kind of bad in certain circumstances of, of weighing probabilities. Yeah, you're like <laughs> after every sentence, you're like stealing what I was about to say, which is good. It's good. <laughs> I, I was literally going to just point to like this is 
a lot of the stuff is indeed ingrained into human nature and, and psychology and whatnot. A lot of your listeners will be familiar with the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, they have that book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where they summarize it, but there's also been a lot of work since then. And humans just are not generally good at probabilistic reasoning. Even, you know, people who have studied this tremendously because it's just kind of like built into our intuition factors and whatnot, and we have to like try to correct them. It's like that gut feeling that you were talking about. Um, and that's, it's just, I know, I'm starting to do the breath thing. <laughs> that, that, say. that is to say. Um, but yeah, it's just ingrained into to all of us, really. And so we just have to slow down, right? You know, you have to use Thomas Bogardus when he says, like, best, you know, oh, good gosh, philosophy so is good. best done slowly. It's best done slowly. You need to slow down. You need to, you know, think clearly, work through the, the problems and whatnot, and really try to train yourself. And yeah, I mean, so you, there are lots of uh, experiments that, that you're talking about, you know, um, but anyway. Okay, uh, it's every time I add a, a comment, it like throws all my my list off. So I, I hope hoping I'm not doing uh, any of these comments twice. So from Mitch Mazarol, please ask if your uh, please ask your guest if Greg Banson at all is an example of good philosophy. Thanks. I've actually never read any Greg Banson, but I haven't really heard good things. Yeah, so I haven't read Greg Banson his work either. I know that he is you know, influential in the presuppositionalist community. And um, I, I can't really say much because I haven't really read much of his work. Um, I tend to read more of like the kind of mainstream philosophy of religion journals and whatnot. And most of that has nothing to do with like presuppositional apologetics. Like that kind of methodology isn't really that big in, in philosophical journals and whatnot. That's not to say that it's bad or wrong. I'm just currently not really taking much of a stance here. I mean, if you want my opinion, like I'm not the biggest fan of presuppositional apologetics, but I mean, that's a whole separate story. I, I can't take a stance right here as to whether or not it's good or bad philosophy without having read it. Did you listen to my interview with Ryan Anderson by chance um, on his argument for God from logic? Because it's a, it's a mean, transcendental like, argument that he gives. Yeah, the, the paper that, that Welty and Anderson published. Yeah, no, I yeah. see that. Yeah, okay, I did listen to that. Yes, yeah, so that that's one, good philosophy. That's like, yeah, because he's like, he's that's basically kind of like an inference of the best explanation. He's saying like, hey, there are these necessarily existent uh, propositions of some kind or another, and the best explanation for why they have all these intentional features like aboutness and whatnot is that they are thoughts within a divine intellect and whatnot. So that that's like not really. That's not really what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about presuppositional apologetics, where it's like, you have to presuppose the truth of Christianity to mount a, an argument against it. And it's like, okay, no. All right. Let's but yes, move on I do to, want to reiterate, uh, that is good philosophy. Yes. Anderson, like okay. that paper, that paper's good and whatnot. But. Yeah. And Malpass has interacted with it and taken it seriously. Yeah. So that's, if anything, that's good reason to take it seriously. Anything that Alex Malpass <laughs> yeah. takes seriously is worth taking seriously. Uh, all right, Trevor Adams says, uh, thanks for your super chat, Trevor. It's my brother's name. What does Joe think of ontological arguments as a whole? I don't know if he remembers, but he helped formalize mine a while back via email. Hmm. Nice. Okay. Uh, sweet. Uh, ontological arguments as a whole. So I kind of like, well, it, it depends. You know, it really depends on the argument. So I think a lot of I don't want to say it's a consensus, but like at least with Anselm's first argument, like most philosophers are like, yeah, when you kind of formalize this, it doesn't really work. Um, you know, he has later arguments, but Anselm was putting his putting his finger on like S5 modal logic and other sorts of things. So he was really important in developing that. And so when it comes to like the modal ontological argument, which I'm super fascinated in, I really like thinking about symmetry breakers. You know, like, okay, so the basic problem for the modal ontological argument, as all your listeners probably know, it's like, hey, there's this premise that it's metaphysically possible that there's a perfect being from which it follows by S5, since a perfect being is a necessary being, it follows that a necessary being actually exists. But of course there's a symmetry problem because, you know, it seems equally epistemically uh, it, the premise that it's metaphysically possible that there is no perfect being seems on epistemic par, as it were, with the original possibility premise. And you can deduce from that one that a perfect being is impossible and so not actual. So that the project in the literature is to try to find symmetry breakers between those two premises, to try to find some considerations that favor one uh, and that don't favor the other. And I think that those are super fun to think about. Um, I recently submitted a paper to a journal on one of them, uh, and I'm, I'm going to work further on it. So I love thinking about symmetry breakers. It's so fun. Um, but that, those are my general thoughts. Um, I think they're yeah. interesting. They're fascinating. Yeah, the reverse ontological argument, modal ontological argument, it, it, that, that's the way that I think about it. it, it you, yeah, you can just call it a symmetry breaker. you got to have some reason to think that 
The possibility premise that theists need is true over the possibility premise that atheists use. Uh, th there's the lack theism stuff coming up again. You can't really use those terms if uh, we're talking about lack theism. But uh, so back to the symmetry breakers. Yeah, when it comes to the ontological argument, that's kind of like where I or where my hangup sits is that when if we're just talking about just pure possibility on one side or the other, it does seem like the reverse ontological argument has, uh, I don't know, I think it's a good response to the modal ontological argument because, okay, so a lot of times they'll, they'll try to like, uh, theists or atheists will try to like give an argument to break the symmetry like you were just talking about. I, I don't know what your paper is all about, but uh, it, in my like in my mind, like, okay, if you're going to give an argument that breaks the symmetry, then like, just give that argument. Don't talk about the ontological yeah. argument. So that's, that's kind of like where my thing comes down to is that like, I think what really what it does or what, what it may do, the, the important work that it does is that it may help us realize that God either necessarily exists or God necessarily does not exist. And so maybe that's what it ultimately gets us to is a necessarily existent or necessarily non-existent God. So that may help rule out some conceptions of God that are, you know, maybe faulty, like uh, Richard Swinburne's version of God, where he's uh, continuing. I hate to say. <laughs> <laughs> Which he may be actually making some uh, some changes there. I don't I don't uh, I don't know if I should make that public, and I don't even know if it's true. But uh, anyways, so that's that's kind of where I sit on the ontological argument as well. Is that like when I first heard it, I was like, I don't really know what this is all about, and then I started to study the modal logic a little bit. Uh, watch, uh, there's a, there's a really good YouTuber. He's, he's an atheist, which, uh, some people might really like the fact that he's an atheist, but he's a philosopher and he's, uh, his YouTube channel is Kane B. You probably have heard of him. He's I got some, Kane B. he's so good. I love him. And, he's uh, on anyways, my channel in, uh, on May the 10th, no, oh, May nice. the 12th. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. He's awesome. Uh, but he's, he's got some really good stuff on modal logic and just explaining, uh, the, Anyways, uh, I won't get into all the details, but I, I started to study the argument and I was like, yeah, this this actually does kind of seem like a good argument. And then once I started to think about the reverse ontological argument and the way that theists kind of respond to it, I was like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. And I think kind of uh, Alvin Planning has kind of had like the same sort of uh, yeah. shift in, in thinking as well as that like he used to think they were really good, like knockdown arguments. And now he's kind of like uh, he's kind of on, on both sides of it now. But anyways, uh, let's move on to, uh, we've got two more questions to get to, and then we'll, uh, we'll try to close the stream out. So from Mintat, 1231, uh, thanks for your super chat. Mintat, what do you two think of atheists saddling themselves with the defense of full-blown reductive materialism slash naturalism? Atheism doesn't entail all that. Uh, I love Seems this question. This is, this is such a good question. Um, so I okay, personally, so you're going to get into, I'm yeah. sure, a lot of good stuff, but I just want to say I hate the naturalism, supernaturalism distinction. I think it's a really bad distinction. Part of that is that I just don't like people mean different things by the term. And so when you actually like get some clarity on it, A, once you actually get clear, I think there's still other problems, but I just don't like that distinction. So I don't know. I, I just prefer to think about it in terms of theism and atheism. So that's just, that's just my preference. I, that to me is a whole lot clearer because you can say God does exist or God doesn't exist. And you can specify what you mean by God. And uh, there's been a whole lot of work on that, you know, and so you can, I think that's just a better way of talking. And I think it helps uh, remove some of the, the objections that you see a lot, a lot of times based on like, you know, uh, natural, uh, I don't know. Anyways, I'll, I'll let you talk. Yeah. So, no, I, I think that's good that um, I, it just points to the use of, you know, like slowing down, defining your terms. I think naturalism and supernatural, like that's okay if you could just, you know, sit down and say, tell me what you mean by natural, tell me what you mean by supernatural, and let's define the terms. That's like what Paul Draper does, right? So uh, Paul Draper, for instance, he says, uh, this is what I mean by naturalism. By naturalism, I mean source physicalism. Source physicalism just says that um, fundamentally in reality, uh, there are physical things, and if there are non-physical things like See, what mind, is a physical say, thing? Well, uh, sorry, maybe, sorry, maybe sorry. It's a I won't cut you off. <laughs> well, yeah, there are different. That's a, that's there. a separate conversation. Be, yeah, well, it could be like spatio-temporal thing, but it, it could also be um, uh, it has the kinds of properties and act activities that figure in our, our best scientific theories. But anyway, we could set that aside. Um, he defines it as source physical. <laughs> he defines it as uh, source physicalism. So fundamentally. Uh, uh, there are physical things, and if there are non-physical things, they are at least ultimately somehow explained by 
physical things. So that allows for uh, dualism of all sorts um, and whatnot. So I think that's a helpful, helpful definition. Um, but anyway, my point is that um, I think this is kind of a problem for both uh, theists and atheists in the apologetics and online sphere, right? So I've gone on some apologetics uh, channels and they're like, uh, uh, if there is no God, then everything is just particles bashing into one another. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Please stop. Like, so I, I think it's on both sides where you kind of have this atheism First of all, associated. Who, who, what channel did you go on where they said that? I don't think I should specify. I'm not going to specify. <laughs> you should, um, <laughs> but I want to know. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you, I'll tell okay. you in private message. Um, but, but yeah, so it's like people, it's kind of on both sides and we should, we should get away from thinking that atheism is intimately tied to a kind of reductive materialist naturalism uh, and, and theism is tied to uh, the other side. Uh, naturalists can perfectly well accept um, all sorts of different, different kind of views or atheists or what have you. They can accept all sorts of different views in philosophy of mind. Uh, they can accept non-reductionism in biology and in chemistry. They can even take a kind of Jonathan Schaefer approach where, I know some people say Schaefer, uh, where like the universe is prior to its you know, fundamental constituents and whatnot. So there, there's a whole panoply of views that, that people can take. And we do need to get away from just conceiving of atheism um, as inherently bound up with this kind of reductive, na like reductive materialistic particles bashing into one another, like no, like we we need to get away from that. Okay, uh, there's two more com one one comment just came in. I'm gonna get the, to get to that one first, and then I've got like the king of all comments coming up. So if you stuck around to this point, you're in for a treat. Okay, uh, this one this one I just have to put up. It just came in from Jackson Howard. Joe is an absolute chat. <laughs> Uh, much love, Jackson. <laughs> all my, oh, that, that gift that you always send, all my like yeah. love and what, what is <laughs> exactly. it called? All my love for you. And it's like pouring yeah. out. He's like dumping yeah. the love. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay. So, uh, here's, here's the next one. Um, again, this is the most important comment, most important thing that we've had on the stream today. Um, but seriously, who created God? Oh man, dude, theism debunked. Uh, so we just need to end the stream. <laughs> Dude, like just, just drop just the mic, the unplug, like die, like just like fall over. <laughs> like bruh. the bra monkey. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, I, let me, let me talk about this for a little bit. So my thinking on this, I actually, I really like this question because I think ultimately the way that like, if you actually formalize it and precisify, precisify, if you get clear on what it is, I think that this actually is kind of like how you distinguish between an atheist or a theist. And it ultimately comes down to like, what is most fundamental? So if you want to say like, who created God, you want to say, okay, well that, that, you know, God is your stopping point. Well, why not just say that like, there's another stopping point beyond God. And so then you got to define what you mean by God. And you can say that God is just like an uncreated being. And then you say the typical move there is to say, well, why can't the universe be uncreated? Why can't that just be? And so ultimately I think that this question, I think I hurt my neck doing that. I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, I think this question can be a, uh, can be the thing like if you really if you really sit down and you really think about it and you're you're just you know you're not just trying to hand wave it away like a lot of apologists will want to do and if you really like are charitable to the atheists and like ultimately what they're trying to get at with this question uh, and part of the part of the reason why I was thinking about this is because Stephen Law has I think a blog post or something along he may even have a paper where he like argues something along these lines but I've also just seen it like. Uh, Sean Carroll seems to do something like this where he'll say, well, you know, if you want to say God is uncreated, then why not just say the universe is uncreated? Why not just stop there? Because we know the universe exists, blah, blah, blah. And so I think that that like once you actually start, stop and think about that and think of the reasons why the universe may not be a good stopping point, why God may be a better stopping point, uh, then I think that, that that actually does raise a very serious philosophical question that gets to sort of the root of like what's going on here. And so I actually... You know, it's fun to it's fun to make jokes and it's fun to like say that this is a silly question, but actually I think it's it's a really good question. No, I I, I love that because this I, I also think that it's getting to something that's almost like core to philosophical inquiry itself. So um, in all domains of philosophy, you see this crop up between different competing theories. One theory says so, so every theory is probably going to have some kind of primitive, some kind of ultimate that is not accounted for 
in further terms that you don't have some mm -hmm. kind of further underlying explanation of. So every theory, whether it's in philosophy of physics or in philosophy of science or in metaphysics, you're going to have some kind of primitives in your theory, some things that you take for granted that you don't have further explanations of. And so what this question is getting at is a meta theoretical question. Why should we privilege your your primitive over mine? Why can't we stop the buck with my primitive instead of trying to, you know, maybe explain my primitive further, but then just yourself bottoming out in a primitive? Because everyone's gonna have to bottom out in a primitive. And and you see this point actually come up all over the place. In today's metaphysics class, so I'm in a metaphysics class here, uh, and and today we were actually just talking about um, the debate between nominalists versus realists. So nominalists say that there are no properties that are had in common by things, uh, roughly, and realists say that there are properties that are had in common by things. And so uh, the nominalist, when we're trying to explain why things like resemble one another, so I have a black right here and black right here, right, in my shirt, like what explains that? In what explains heart. why these things are resemble one another? Well, the realist says because they have this one property shared in common among them, blackness. and uh, and the, the nominalist says, well, listen, resemblance, that's just a primitive fact. We don't have to give some kind of further account in terms of, let's say, properties. The nominalist says it's a primitive fact. The realist says, ah, I can explain that. I can give you a shared property. But the, what the nominalist can do then is saying, well, hold on a second. Like, what explains those those properties? And what explains this relation of exemplification between the particulars and the properties? It's it's a primitive in the in the realist's theory. You have primitive, you help yourself to the properties, you help yourself to the exemplification relation. So both of them have primitives on this view, and the nominalist kind of just um, has a primitive earlier in the explanatory chain, as it were. Uh, but the nominalist is, and you can make a case for each point. You can, the anomalist could say, well, listen, you've just postulated this extra thing, but then you've bottomed out in this primitive just like I did. Why not stop the buck early? Um, the, and then the realist could say, well, listen, there's, a, there's an explanation for this phenomenon on offer that I can give that you can't. Um, so like the, you, can, you can see, you can get inside both of their perspectives. And my point in, in this little digression, because I got really excited when you said that, my point here, <laughs> is that, my point here is that, listen, this question, what created God or who created God, does get to perhaps a fundamental question to all of philosophical inquiry. And it's about comparing theories in every single domain and what you take as primitive. So it's a brilliant question and keep on asking it, new atheists. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far, Joe. I wouldn't go that far. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say just think, just use it to, as like a start. As, just continue thinking about it. Don't, <laughs> yeah, don't just do ask it and think slowly. that you've like done. Yeah. Don't, don't just ask it and think that you've done anything like use it as a, as a way of like thinking about the two theories and, and weighing the arguments on both sides. I don't, I also don't want people to think that like you can just ask the question or, or say that like, okay, well I land on this side and think that you've done anything. You've got to actually look at, you know, reasons on both sides. Cause there, there, yeah. there are arguments for the existence of God. There are arguments for, for atheism that kind of like highlight the differences between the two. And so it's a good, it's like, it's a good starting point. And I think that it's a good way of really, uh, if you take it seriously, then you can use it as a way of getting deeper and looking at the potential, you know, upsides of both views and the arguments for them. So that's what I would say. I wouldn't say just like, ask it and you're done. Uh, but I don't, I don't I think did, that's what you meant. And you're done. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, had to, I had to end on a bang, you know, I had to. You had to. Yeah. I, I made a joke in there and you didn't hear it, by the way. You were, you were saying, look at all these black things. And I said, oh, and also your heart. And you didn't hear it. I was very hurt by that. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, my heart is filled with uh, love and and it's filled with gifts, really. I send gifts to everyone. <laughs> filled with gifts. Okay. Uh, is there anything that we need to say to, to end this stream? Because we've gone a little bit long. Um, I've already talked about your channel a bunch. And so definitely go subscribe to his channel. Uh, if you're watching this channel, if, if you enjoyed this video, then subscribe to my channel as well. Uh, also, if you find this kind of content valuable, the way that we are able to do this thing on a weekly basis and on a daily basis really is through your support on Patreon. So patreon.com slash caption Christianity links are in the description. Uh, Joe also has a Patreon. So if you're, you know, he's, he's a student, he needs some help. He's got a, a bag of cereal sitting on his desk. That's the way that he feeds himself and he needs food. Uh, Patreon is a way of, of supporting both of us. So thank you guys for watching regardless. Uh, anything to, to say to close out the, the stream today? No, I mean, I thank you for having me on here. And I guess a big takeaway is just, you know, again, philosophy is best done slowly. Really try to get to the, I don't know, don't settle for the slogans. Like get to the deep issues, do it with charity, care, caution, 
and, and love, really. And I guess one final thing is, if you want to learn more about my critiques of scientism, I know I, I've made it really short, but I have a chapter in my book on scientism. <laughs> and a lot of people said that they really like that chapter. So um, yeah, it's just the Majesty reason. It's on, it's on Amazon. But you know, you always got to do the shameless plug. I mean. <laughs> you got to. I did want to say one last, yeah. I'll, I'll say one last thing about slogans because I have like, I don't have two slogans. I, I at least have one, by the way, Christianity is true. So in one sense, slogans can be good if you're using it as a way of like promoting conversation. But if you're doing yeah. it as a conversation stopper, then that's where it's an issue. But if you use it as conversation starter, that's different. So that's the way that I look at it. it there's a there's a difference between those two there. Uh, so slogans can be good if you're using it in one in one way, but if you're using it as like you know a, a way to like stifle the the way that the conversation was going, that's not good. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. And until next time, see you guys in the next Capturing Christianity video. Peace.